Hello, everyone. Welcome to the series Mud Talks, the science and fun of sourdough bread making with Jean Davis, parent of a 25, class of 25. My name is Vanessa Chu, Assistant Director in the Office of Alumni and Parent Relations. We thank you for attending today's event. You're in for a special treat featuring a live demo today. This talk is being recorded and will be distributed after the event. Please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A Q a box, not the chat, and we will try to get through as many questions as possible. Now, I'm going to turn it over to our sourdough expert to introduce himself. Gene, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the sourdough class, and, and we're going to just jump right in, um, first with getting a bake started, and then I'll uh, do a little bit of intro and, and presentation along the way. So let me, uh, I think we're already looking at my screen here, so I'm going to just point the camera just a little bit further down. What you're seeing here is a loaf that's just about ready to go in the oven. And all I'm going to do is just do the last couple of steps, and then we're going to get it started because I want to show you how it comes out of the oven uh, in about 30 minutes, and then we're going to cut into it before this talk is over. And then I'm going to walk you through some basics about the whole sourdough process, and then we're going to literally simulate 24 hours of activity in about 24 minutes to see all the different steps that I went through to, to make this. But let's get this guy in the oven. So it's already been shaped it's already pretty much ready to go it needs one extra thing done to it and that's what they call scoring and that's literally you know cutting some kind of pattern into the bread you can do all kinds of things why you score bread is you need to give ventilation paths and expansion channels for how the bread's going to expand as it as it uh, vents through those holes and i'm cutting it this way because I don't want it to kind of fall out. I want it to go up and these kind of this kind of venting will do that. So I'm going to pop this thing in the oven that I already preheated at 450. We'll get that started for my oven. Set the timer for 13 minutes. I'm going to be baking this for 13 minutes in a steam setting. And then we're going to bake it in 13 minutes in more of a classic convection oven setting. And then we're going to pull it out and let it sit for a little bit. And then we'll cut it open and take a look at it. But that's this particular oven. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about, you know, the process that I went through to do this and how you can do it yourself. So I'm going to switch to sharing my screen. Switch to slideshow mode here. And we're on our way. So again, name's Gene Davis, got a mutter at, uh, in, for class of 25, having a great time there. So happy to support anything we can do for mud. Here's some example loaves that I've made over the years, all from the same starter that I'm about to show you and which you guys can get your hands on as well uh, later on. And we'll talk about that later on in the, in the presentation. So we've got the live bake going. The rest of the agenda is about a little bit about my background and what we want to try to get done today, some of the science of the sourdough. And, you know, sourdough, it always sounds a little scary, but, you know, is it really? And then we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the tools. I'm going to simulate literally in a baking demonstration the, you know, even though it takes many hours clock time to make sourdough bread, it's not that much of your time. And that's the good news. So I'm going to show you all of that. Then we'll talk about the starter itself and some variations you can do, tips and tricks. And we're going to make sure we check on that bake once it's done and any uh, time for Q&A afterwards. Okay, so again, my name's Gene. I've been baking sourdough since about 2011. Uh, certainly, we know during COVID times it became especially popular, which is awesome. Uh, since 2011, uh, 2011, I've been averaging about two loaves a week. Um, so that's added up to quite a few now that I, I think about it, but it's also, I've taught some classes and use it as sort of a charity auction type thing for schools and churches and stuff. And everyone really enjoys it. Uh, and it's, it's just a great little hobby to have. So my goal is to show you how easy it is and hopefully get you started uh, with it yourself. First of all, just some basic science on here. You know, there are so many pages out on the web you can read about this, but we'll just stick to the basics. You do start with a starter. 
And what is the starter? It's yeast and bacteria that's in a very, you know, stable symbiotic mix, if you will, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's very specific bacteria and yeast that you have a nice low acidity, but, uh, and keep the harmful bacteria away, but keep the, the helpful bacteria there and then becomes the basis for your sourdough bread. The acidity is partly what gives it the sour flavor. Um, and just with any loaf making, you're adding flour and water and you're creating a, a fermentation cycle. Uh, the, the yeast that's part of the process combines with the dough and the water and outputs ethanol and carbon dioxide. Uh, and the carbon dioxide is, of course, what puffs up uh, bread. So that's not very different from any other bread process. It's just that the, uh, the yeast that we're using is a natural yeast from the sourdough, not, for instance, like an instant yeast that you buy in the store. Once you've kind of got things going in what we call an initial fermentation, and I'll demonstrate all this shortly, then you add salt. Salt's always going to be there for flavor, and then you can tune how much salt you're going to use. Uh, and then once the salt's added, then we're going to go through some proofing and dough stretching processes, which is going to give the bread its strength so that when it does bake, it holds its shape and, and starts to look like what you're expecting to see. Once it's shaped and rested a little bit, then we're ready to bake it, just like what's going on right now. Now, one of the things about sourdough that's kind of interesting, and I'm realizing you can't quite see my head, I apologize, but is you do need to be a little flexible. And the reason is, is that even though instant yeast is fairly predictable, sourdough yeast is different. It's highly temperature sensitive. So if you keep your house at 65 degrees Fahrenheit, for instance, you're gonna have a very different experience than if you keep your house at 75 degrees, as an example. And so you kind of need to have a little bit of a back of the mind paying attention to that. And I'll show you some tricks about that. Uh, the reason that it's, uh, that you can't therefore can't use it in a bread machine, for instance, is because of that temperature sensitivity. Maybe a you know some AI bread machine in the future will be able to pay more attention to what's really going on with the bread and be able to handle it. But right now you won't find bread machine recipes for sourdough that you can really rely upon unless they're also adding instant yeast to help uh, make the process more reliable. So you do need to be a little flexible. So is it really hard? Well, it seems like it, but I don't think it really is. You know, you, you're going to need a starter, but it's easy to get one and or you can make your own. And I'll tell you about that later on, too. Now, it does take a lot of time to make time wise. I've mentioned 24 hours and and the loaf I just started. I started 24 hours ago about at the very beginning. And I'll show you that. Um, but it's not much of your time. So that's the good thing. You just you just got to do a certain set of steps along the way. There are ways to speed that up, but again, I suggest you just kind of stick with the straight and narrow at first as you do it. Uh, the next comment I have here is, don't I need steam? And the answer is, uh, it helps a lot. It helps greatly to give the loaf the right lift. And there are tricks to do that. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the Dutch oven way to do that, which is the most common way uh, you do it unless you have a steam oven. We did Dutch oven for years until we finally just bought a steam oven because I was making sourdough bread so much. So uh, the Dutch ovens work great and I'll, and I'll uh, show you that. Now there's a, an interesting notion about when you're doing the sourdough and what's this notion about proofing, overproofing, underproofing. Uh, that actually is a subtlety that you just need to kind of learn about. The good news is even though there's a tendency to accidentally overproof and I think the first many loaves that I made at the very beginning when I got started, they were all overproofed. The good news is no matter what, as long as you don't burn the bread and you remember the salt, it's going to taste great. So don't panic if your loaf is a little flat or something like that. It's, it's, it's always going to still taste good no matter what you do. Next, let's talk a little bit about the ingredients so um, and tools. So. Almost certainly you're gonna need a bowl and a spoon and a knife and an oven and especially oven mitts, very important. And of course, from the ingredients perspective, you're gonna need flour, water, salt, 
and of course, the starter. So let me point at that for a second. We'll get to the starter in a moment. But let me just talk a little bit about the, the flower. Uh, King Arthur flower I find to be very reliable and generally flower I like to use because it's got a higher protein count and it just makes it much easier to just make the load. So keep an eye out for this. It's, you can see it and just find it in just about any uh, store. If you can't, Bread flour in general works. I've just had the most, I've tried various bread flours. I've had the most success actually, consistent success with, uh, with the King Arthur loaf. So that's the flour part. Water, you wanna just make sure you're using a filtered water, um, not distilled and not water with, uh, let's say, you know, chloramines or something like that. So just a filtered water works great there. And then salt, you can use whatever salt you'd like. You know, some people, Think it's important to use different kinds of salt but um, as long as it's finely uh, ground because you you're, it's going to help you mix it uh, if it's a more of a fine salt than let's say a coarse salt so just kind of keep that in mind and and of course salt is to taste more than anything else now talking about some of the tools you're really going to wish you had beyond just the basics the first is a scale and so you want to have some kind of a scale and ideally the scale gets all the way down to the gram level. We're going to do everything in grams today. So you want it to be a fairly accurate scale, not, uh, not too inaccurate. Um, and you want it to have a, what they call a tear function so that as you're filling up bowls and you're putting stuff in it, you can hit the tear button that zeroes out the value. It makes it easier to add additional ingredients. We'll get into that in a little bit more later on. Scrapers very useful tools. There's the metal kind with a flat blade. And also these plastic ones are very nice of curved. I like these especially because not only are they good for scraping when you need to scrape flour, but they're especially good for cleaning up afterwards because they bend, they shape to the bowls that you're using, makes cleaning up a lot easier. So you wanna have a scraper, things like that. Proofing bucket, what the heck is a proofing bucket? Well, a proofing bucket, You'll, we'll see it in action in a little bit, but it looks like this. It's got measurements on it to kind of help you see as the dough is rising, how far it's risen relative to where it was earlier. So we'll see that in action. And it's just kind of a handy little thing to have. A uh, flour shaker, or I'll sometimes called a flour duster. It's just a thing like here. You'll see me use that a little later on. And then the Dutch oven. I have a picture of one on the screen. The one on the screen is uh, most desirable, I would say. Why do I say that? It's because it's, first of all, those are very cheap and you can get them at Target or whatever, uh, as opposed to other Dutch ovens. But more importantly, it's, it's about the lid. Now, the, any Dutch oven will work. And the reason why the Dutch ovens work is because you're trying to create a steam environment where the bread's baking. And, the Dutch oven does a great job of keeping that steam in from the air, from the moisture that's actually naturally in the dough as it bakes. The reason why I prefer the one that's on the screen is because in, in point of fact, ideally what you do is cook it with the Dutch oven upside down. And it's a little tricky to do that in an oven with these big, handles like this. But if you got those narrow ones like that one, it'll slip right between the slots of an oven. So, and the, why people like to do it like this is because you actually would cook the bread here and then here's your sort of your fancy little top like so. Now I'm not baking it that way now because I I don't even know where my, my real Dutch oven is that used to look just like this one. But I just kind of wanted to show you that Dutch ovens work great and the quality of the bread is the same either way really whether you're using a Dutch oven or a steam oven like I've got. Steam ovens tend to be well convenient, but people don't always have them. So that's the Dutch oven part. And we can answer any questions about that as we go forward. Okay, 24 hours and 24 minutes or less. I think we're doing pretty well on time so far. So I'm going to stop sharing and get back on the main screen. And we're gonna start stepping through the process of making the bread. So the first one is the starter, like I was showing you earlier. 
the starter again, I've mean, had it for a little over 11 years now. You want to label it because you don't want anyone to throw it away. <laughs> Do not throw away. And starter by itself, it's just not very exciting yet, right? It's, I keep this in the refrigerator. I suggest you do too, unless you're baking every day, because if you leave it in the refrigerator, you can, you can bake bread every, oh, I've got my timer going off. So what I'm gonna do is I'm switching my bread that's baking from steam mode to just regular convection mode. And right now the bread looks like this. And I'm going to put it in longer because we want it to be obviously fully cooked and it's going to look nice and dark too when we're finished. So get that going. I reset the timer for another 13 minutes. So back to the starter here. This, the basic starter, refrigerated, it'll keep for a good couple of weeks before you have to feed it. We'll talk about feeding in a little bit, but you'll see that it has, you know, a few bubbles. And, but otherwise it kind of looks like pancake uh, mix or whatever, right? It just looks like pancake batter. So nothing too exciting, but it's bubbling away and that's good. That means that the yeasty beasties and, and everything else is in a nice balance. If I left it out for two or three days, I might start to see some liquid on top. That liquid would be some of the ethanol byproduct that comes out of it. It's uh, so a little bit of trivia, you, you hear the term hooch, and that's what it is, the alcohol that comes out of uh, uh, you know, this leavening process. So um, it's okay to have a little bit of that in there, and that works fine. Um, just make sure you, keep, you feed your, your uh, sourdough starter at least every two weeks. All right, so I'm gonna use some of that. Gene? Yes. Can I interrupt you really quick? You bet. Back to the Dutch oven. Um, you didn't mention enameled cast iron versus cast iron. I find that ECI finish can be wrecked. Is that your experience? I have uh, can be wrecked, as in it, it ruins the uh, it ruins the actual um, cast. It, the, it ruins the Dutch oven. So when I had one, uh, I used the the black style and it worked great just as it was but other people that i've taught have had the fancier ones like that white one and they had no problems with it so i'm not sure if someone did have a problem i'd be interested to find out more about that um, great thank you okay so what i'm going to do is do step one so at the beginning of that 24 hour period, I'm gonna pull my starter out of the refrigerator. I'm gonna make sure I've got my scale ready and I'm gonna mix 150 grams of this stuff. And you'll, you can kind of see that it's kind of, even though I said pancake batter, it's much thicker than that and gummy, you know, it's kind of gummy like that. And I know that that's gonna be roughly, somewhere around there is about 150 grams. You don't have to be very precise with that number, I got 160, that's close enough. And then if I needed to, I would feed this starter and uh, extra, and we'll talk a little bit about that later before returning to the refrigerator. But now I've got 150 of that. Now I've pre-measured out 150 grams of water. So I'll just kind of stir that in like so, it doesn't have to be perfect. And then I would do the same thing again with 150 grams of flour. So one to one to one ratio, giving you 450 grams-ish roughly of this mix. And we'd mix all this up till it's all thoroughly mixed. And it'll look something like this once, once you've got it mixed. It's thicker, obviously, and you know, it's certainly thicker than pancake batter, but it's still very wet. You'll notice this is not this is not a dough. This is not like your typical bread dough type of consistency. It's a very wet dough. Then a very important thing, because this is going to be this needs to sit for a while. Let me put this down here. Is one of my secret weapons is a nice. I like press and seal because it sticks to just about anything, but a, a, just a nice cover for this. So I would cover this like so and let it sit for 
about eight to 10 hours, maybe even 12, until it's happy. Now that's a technical term, happy, that we're about to get to. Jane? Yes. Does the water need to be at a specific temperature? No, uh, any temperature is fine. And then also, was it 150 grams of water with the starter in the bowl or 150 grams total of water? It's 150 grams of starter, 150 grams of water, 150 grams of flour. Perfect. One, 150 you. each. Thank you. Now, oh, you bet. So when I said, what does it mean for it to be happy? Well, after about 10 to 12 hours, it'll look something like this. It's going to be a party in there. You can just see sudsy bubbles. It should look sudsy and, and just what I call really happy. It's ready. It's already munching away at all. The, your yeasty BCs are already munching away at what you, you just fed it, and it's ready for the next step. Well, what the next step is, is now we're going to actually make our dough for the loaf from this. So now I'm going to take a much bigger bowl, and I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I've already pre-measured things, so I don't have to really need the scale. I'm going to put in this very happy starter. You can just see there's lots of bubbles in it, and it's, it's expanded a lot with all the gases trapped in it, like so. Get that out of the way. I'm going to add 400 grams of water to that, like so. Now, one of the tests, you're wondering, kind of wondering, what the heck is happy uh, starter? One of the tests that people mention you might read online is that it floats in the water. So you can see that this is floating in the water. That's a, that's a good example of happy starter. Okay. I've got that. I'll stir it together a little bit. Doesn't have to be perfect by any means. You just kind of want to get it sloshed together. And then you're going to, you can of course use a mixer for this, but you can also do it by hand like I'm doing now. Then you just kind of slowly add the flour a little bit at a time. And it's going to, now it's going to get a lot thicker, of course. I'm going to move this out of the way. And we're going to stir this a bit. And I keep stirring it. And in the interest of time, since it's already moving along, I'm probably not going to finish stirring this. Just a couple more minutes, it would be fully stirred. But you want it obviously fully brought together and, and one consistent dough. Now, it's going to be still pretty wet. You know, again, there you might be familiar with making regular bread that it's looking like it's starting pretty dry, but it's actually going to get pretty wet uh, once you finish mixing. But I'm going to keep going in the interest of time. So we'll just kind of set that aside. Jane, how much flour did you add after nope. the water? It was 400 grams of water and 650 grams of flour. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Let's say that I've done that, which I just did. I'm gonna let that sit kind of like an initial fermentation phase for two to three hours until you can see some noticeable rising to it. So it'll start, you know, kind of dense and thick and lumpy and stuff. But over time, it's gonna smooth out a little bit and start to rise. And so I've gone ahead and again, in the interest of time, speeding things up here, here's what it would look like after, let's say two hours or so. This one's been sitting for maybe two and a half hours. So there might even be some bubbles that you can see through it, but it's definitely you know, started to rise. At this point, now is the time that we're gonna add the salt. This is 20 grams of salt. And then to help mix the salt in, I'm adding about 50 grams of water. So 20 grams of salt, 50 grams of water. Then I take my spatula again. Stick this spatula here. Now you're gonna notice a little bit of a different mixing process this time. Make sure I'm on here. At this point, because there's enough structure to it, you're gonna wanna try to preserve that. We're not, from this point forward, we're gonna to try to wanna to encourage uh, bond building without like slicing the dough. So as I kind of mix in this water salt mixture, I'm doing a lot of little mini folds to fold it into place. 
Okay, see that? It's just folding, folding, and the water's slowly getting absorbed into that. It doesn't have to be 100% absorbed into it, but you want it basically through there, and you, you obviously are trying to get make sure that the salt is well mixed in and in this process. So now, and you can see now especially, it's a very wet looking dough, right? And this is the time when especially this proofing bucket is handy. So I get out the proofing bucket and literally slosh it in like so. And again, this is also where the measuring on the side becomes handy because you can kind of see it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit below that 2L line. And it's just sitting here just like that. So far, so good. All right. Gene, Let's keep, yeah. Do you have any suggestion on a good room temperature to keep the rising dough happy? So, again, it doesn't matter too much, but it does. It will impact the amount of time. I, you know, our house is typically sixty-eight to seventy degrees, and the times that I'm kind of reporting to you take that amount of time. If your house is warmer, it will go quicker. If your house is cooler, it will just go slower, but it'll still all work. So I put a lid on this to cover it and protect it, and now we're into essentially the what what sometimes is called the proofing phase. Now, interestingly, we still have to do some stuff here. You know, a lot of doughs, you do a lot of kneading and stuff like that. This kind of bread, you don't do too much kneading, but every hour, roughly. So this this bread's now. I'm, I'm bringing out a bit of bread that's, you can see it's risen. It's gone from below the 2L line to somewhere around the 2L line. And so this is about after an hour of time has passed. And what we're gonna do are something called turns on the bread. I'm washing my hands and getting them wet. You wanna have wet hands when you do this. And what you're gonna do is reach into this very wet dough and kind of stretch it and turn it and stretch it, turn it and stretch it, turn it and stretch it. Maybe one more for luck. So four to five times, and you may have noticed, I'm not sure if you saw it, but in the process of doing that, the dough is actually, you can feel it getting thicker and stronger and able to hand, you know, for instance, hold on to more uh, air pockets and things like that. I've done that once and I'm gonna do it once every 45 minutes to an hour, three more times, okay? So let's suppose that I've done that. Let's get that one out of the way. And I've done that three or four times. Now I'm getting close to where I'm just about ready to start baking. And so the dough you'll see just continues to rise. I might give this one more final set of turns. Oh, my, my timer went off after my next 13 minutes. So I'm gonna take the bread out to start cooling. We'll look at it in a little bit. Actually, I realize I made a mistake. Of course, that's how demos work, right? That bread I didn't hit the bake button on that. That's got to bake for another 10 minutes at least. So when I thought I hit it, the timer for 13 minutes, I didn't uh, hit the start button on the oven. Mistake on my part. Set a timer for 10 minutes, but that's okay. We've got time. Okay, so now, thank you. Um, so now I'm going to do a final stretch on this spread real quick. And you'll see that it's, again, much thicker still. When you're doing your stretches on it, you don't want to stretch it so much that it tears. You'll know when it tears because you'll see it tear. Right now, I'm just kind of stretching it within the limits of, of, its, of its elasticity. But it's, it, and every time that you do stretch it, you can see it kind of sits up higher uh, because of that added strength you've just given it. Okay, now, what we're gonna do is get ready to start shaping it. That's the next step. So essentially we've made our dough, we've 
let it do its initial permutation. We added the salt. We've done some rises and some turns and stretches. And now we're ready to shape it into a loaf. So how do we do that? Well, what I do is I first, this is where the flour duster comes in handy. Put down a healthy amount of flour. Get that out of the way. It's kind of a work area because this dough is very wet. And then I'm going to come along here and just drop the dough on just like that. Try not to touch it or anything. I don't need to touch it. I just want to get it out of there and it'll just flop right out of that proofing bucket pretty easily. Here is again where the, the scraper comes in handy because you can use it to cut this. This is this recipe is designed to make roughly two one pound loaves. So I'm just going to cut it in half. Gene, I have a scraper. few questions for you. Sure. Uh, does a slower versus faster rise affect the flavor? And then does it affect how sour the bread is? Yes, a slower, good question. A slower rise will, uh, will make the bread more sour. The longer you can go with that, the better. However, over time as well, um, you won't get as high of a rise uh, if you, the longer you go, because essentially you're, you're fighting the, 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 the production of the acids in the bread versus uh, the strength of the protein that are, that's gonna be eaten uh, as part of the food supply for the yeast. And so um, uh, I'll, cover, I'll come back to that a little bit with, uh, as you do, as uh, we get to some variations in a little bit. And then is so, it- Go ahead. Is it possible to get too sour? Um, I've never, I, no one's ever complained about it being too sour. <laughs> the, what ends up happening is if it, if it were to be too sour, it, it, it might not even uh, rise much when you bake it. So if you like a super dense sour bread, you might let it even go much longer before you even bake it. And again, I'll talk about that in a little bit about a variation that you can do. I have two more questions for you. Okay. Um, how sticky is it at this point? With your so this this it, it's it's very wet but you can see it, it's not that it's you know it's it's sticky but it's not you know overly sticky and then of course since I'm now doing this shaping I'm kind of cover coating the outside with a little extra flour and this isn't sticky at all and then our last question for now uh, does it rise covered or not covered it um, when you use the Dutch oven, you leave it covered, and that's when the main rising is going to happen for the first 15 minutes in the Dutch oven uh, at 450 degrees. So you're gonna preheat the, uh, let's say you're using a Dutch oven. I'm not, but that's, it's close enough. You're gonna be in sort of a steam mode, meaning leave the Dutch oven lid on for the first 15 minutes, and then take it off because you want the, a convection oven effect to help give the outside a nice, uh, crispy crust. And we'll see that in the bread that I'm making now. So now I'm doing this shaping and the shaping is kind of fun because again, you're doing these stretches and you're doing something, I'll show you here in a second, where it's, it's uh, you know, this door is obviously very pliable. And since it's kind of dusted in flour, if I don't, if I think I need, need more flour, I can put more flour on it. I'm doing these turns and tightens. So I don't know if you can see that very well, but I'm turning the bread with one hand while tucking underneath the other. And so this is giving the shape to the dough for the loaf. And at the same time, making a tight surface on the top. And I don't know if you can see this very well with the camera. Let me see if I can get a little closer here. But there's, you know, now you can start seeing the little bubbles that everyone really appreciates in a sourdough bread, because again, the tightening especially helps expose that and, and everything that we're doing. Now there's, obviously you can do various shapes that you can leave it like this and it would be a round, or what you can do also is give it a little bit of a toss and give it more of a shape like I was doing in the one that I'm cooking right now, which is what they call a batard. It's more of a loaf shape which the kids like because you know it cuts better for sandwiches and, and stuff like that. And so you just kind of keep doing that until 
I'm not, notice I'm not overworking and I'm not overhandling and I'm just trying to get a basic shape. If there's any mistake some people do, it's that they overwork the dough and then you basically kind of destroyed the structure of the bread and all of the bubbles that are inside. So you don't need to overwork it. So I might bake one like this as a, as a more of a loaf and I might bake another one like this as a round. So these are essentially what you do is you, you'd shape them however you want and then you would uh, let them rest for 20 minutes and then they're ready to go in the oven just like this other one did uh, a little bit ago. I'm gonna check on this one here. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this guy out now. He's not as dark as I want him to be, but he's not too bad. What's another interesting subtlety with the bread is uh, it always looks darker than you think. When you first pull it out, you go, oh my gosh, I burned it. No, you didn't. It's going to be fine. Only if you smell burn is it probably burnt. So let's take a look at this loaf. Now, remember your mitts for just about any time you're handling any of the hot stuff. But here's our loaf right there. And so you can see it puffed up nicely. It's you know, it's, it's got a lot of interesting features that this kind of bread has. There's what they call blistering. You see these little tiny blisters. That's kind of what you're looking for. And then it's interestingly, some people think, oh, I, the best time to eat the loaf is right now. In point of fact, I found, although there's some debate about this, that uh, it tastes better if you let it sit for about 15 minutes. It'll obviously it'll cool down a little bit. It will, uh, but there's still a little bit of uh, acid conversion going on between acetic acid and the lactic acid. But let's just go ahead and cut this guy open for the moment just to take a look. And you can see your classic bubbly, pockety sourdough bread. And now I, I still probably wouldn't have done that for about 15 minutes, but for the purpose of making sure we get through the fun things in this class, Thought I'd do that. And let's get back to, let's hopefully cool through quick more or less to 25 minutes. Gene, yep. can we bake it in a on a baking sheet instead of a Dutch oven? You can, you're just not gonna get quite as much moisture uh, in the oven. Now, where did my presentation go? I must have iconified it somewhere. Uh, one moment, folks. And then well, I, I know, I know you'll get screens. to this later, but do you recommend putting additional items in the bread as a change of pace or no? And if you wanted to put I things do. in it, do you do that just before shaping? Uh, you, uh, good question. And I'll cover that in just a little bit once I find my presentation that I, wait, is it here? Okay, I lost it. It's okay, I can close a lot of these windows. Nobody cares about my office stuff. I just don't know where it went. That's so weird. Ah. There it is. It was on another screen. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, one moment and we'll get back on track here. Slide show. And so we've kind of done the 24 hours and 24 minutes or less. And let's start now talking about the starter itself. So um, I'm bringing uh, containers of my starter, especially for those that signed up for it uh, this weekend. Uh, I live in, the, in the, the Northern California area, but coming down for a mud concert and uh, uh, will be available on these dates and Vanessa's gonna be covering for me on uh, on Monday. So I'll be there on Sunday. I think the intention is the Shanahan building and then at Kingston, uh, she'll be available with the starters. And so you're gonna get a container. If you come by, you'll get a container that looks something like the ones in the upper right hand corner. Uh, you'll need to transfer the starter that's in there into a larger container. And as soon as you can do so, the, you know, the sooner the better, 
add 200 grams of water, 200 grams of flour, and put it in your refrigerator until you're ready to follow all these instructions and do it yourself. And as long as you do it within the next two weeks, you won't even have to feed it in advance. Um, otherwise, anytime that you're using the starter, you're gonna wanna make sure that you do keep it fed, typically every one to two weeks um, uh, on a schedule. Um, but you can be flexible about that. It's just that you'll, you'll notice when you, you, you need to start feeding. Now, there are alternatives to this approach, especially if you're more remote. Um, King Arthur's website lets you just order starter online and they'll ship it to you. So that's kind of nice. Uh, I've seen starter kits at some gourmet stores. So um, that usually is like a dry packet that then you can, it reconstitutes. I've never tried reconstituting dry starter, so I can't really, you know, claim that I've done that myself, but um, it can be done. I've also had friends just go to a local bakery and they'll just give them some of their starter if they have a sourdough uh, bread they sell. Or you can just make it yourself, which takes seven or more days. And I'm gonna walk you through that shortly. And just as a reminder, you do need to feed it on a bit of a schedule. And usually I, I feed it in concert with when I'm making the bread. So I take out that 150 grams for the recipe. And then I could put in 150 grams you know, like 75 grams of water, 75 grams of flour, or if I know I'm gonna make bread again in another week, I can wait another week and then put in, you know, what's what I took out essentially. So just make sure every two weeks you, you keep it fed. So let's talk about if you wanted to make your own starter, how would you go about it? And this is exactly how I did it in uh, the, the San Francisco Bay area uh, 11 years ago, started with, Again, 300 grams of water and flour, mix them together, and you cover it with a cloth because you do want some airflow in and out. And you're gonna let that, you're gonna do some stirring over the next several days, but otherwise you're just gonna leave it alone. And by day four, you should, and this was true for me, you should see some bubbles already. They're not gonna be that many. Certainly it's not gonna be a party yet, but there will be some bubbles. And if you're getting any bubble activity, that means you're on your way. If you see no bubbles, some people say to just go back to day one and, and try again. But um, you know, just uh, see if you can get some bubbles and hopefully uh, that gets you going. Now, it's still not ready for use yet. You need to kind of get it stable. And so what they have you do, at least for the next three days, I did longer, but I think you know the minimum they say is seven total days is every day after that, you're gonna throw away half of the starter. So. You, you throw away 300 grams and you add in 300 more grams, 150 of the flour and 150 of the water. And this constitutes a feeding. So you're basically, you've got your yeast and bacteria culture going and you're now doing a, a feeding schedule to you know, basically feed these hungry yeasty beasties. This is all at room temperature, by the way. Um, and then you can, if you want to help accelerate the process, or I just did it just, to be more conservative, you can just keep at that for a few more days uh, with the same pattern even more rapidly because as the yeast get more active, they're gonna be more hungry and they're gonna wanna eat more often. So you can see here, I was then doing it twice a day for days eight through 14. So at that point, now you know you've got you know a very healthy starter, things are really cranking, the yeast are eating away and, and bubbling away. At that point, it's ready to, uh, be put in the refrigerator until that point, you don't want it, you know, you don't want it to get too cold or, or it may not really get going. And you definitely don't want it to ever get too hot because that'll just kill the yeast. So, but this pattern worked for me. I didn't need any anything else special. But once you've gotten through that and you've got a nice, healthy, uh, robust starter, it'll just keep going, you know, and, and stay in the refrigerator to use as you as you need it. Now let's talk a little bit about some variations on the theme. People, I, I showed you how I just used my regular old bread knife to score the bread, but people uh, might buy something called a bread score or a lame, like you see there. It's basically a razor blade on a stick, but you can do fancy patterns and, and you can look up uh, these things online. People, people do some really cool things for how they you know, essentially uh, create those the scoring on the bread and make pretty uh, flowery types of pictures. Now, if people are worried that their house is too cold or their environment is 
is not right, you could actually invest in something called a proofing oven that I show on the right. They're not too expensive and they collapse actually. So those sides are collapsible. It folds down pretty flat, but it'll help you keep a, you know, a modest temperature if you feel like your house is too cold or it's just taking too long for your, uh, for your bread to, uh, to come together as you expect. Now, the third item on the list is, a, is like a clay cloche. So alternatively to a clay oven, for instance, or excuse me, alternatively to a Dutch oven, you can use kind of like this little mini clay oven, which uh, works just as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, I, what I find is it's, because it's got the risen sides, you don't, it, the, the bread isn't necessarily as crunchy the, 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 on the outside when it comes out, but it still works out pretty well. Um, so it's glazed on the inside, so it's, it's uh, pretty easy to maintain. And that's an, another option as an alternative to the Dutch oven. And then this kind of gets around to making bread more sour. So there's these things called bannetons or a shaping basket. It's basically wicker. And what you can do toward the end, you might recall that I made this sort of what I call the batard shape. If I wanted to, at this point, I could bake it now or nearly now, or I could put it in one of these baskets, cover it, and then put it in the refrigerator overnight. And that'll do two things. One is it'll create that really cool pattern like you see on some more professional loaves that give you those fun little ridges that you get from these baskets. But two is it'll it's giving the bread more time to uh, gain more sourness and gain more character. It may not pop as much when you bake it, but for instance, I might do that, you know, the night before, if I'm too tired or something, I could pop it in one of these baskets, uh, cover it up, put it in the refrigerator, and then uh, bake it first thing in the morning. And then you get the cool, uh, you know, ridges on it. You'll still need to score the bread, but it does give you kind of a fun little pattern, nice little variety. Other varieties are, of course, I'm sticking, I stuck to the most basic recipe for this uh, presentation today, but um, you can use different flours. The most common thing is to add uh, wheat flour as opposed to just bread flour. Uh, I, um, a lot of times I'll just, I'll add a small amount of wheat flour. Let's say I'll substitute 100 grams for wheat flour of the bread flour. That, that you almost, you, you can do that almost without thinking and it won't really negatively impact the recipe. But you, I, uh, if you want to work your way to a whole wheat loaf, do it gradually. Because if you, uh, any, any, my recommendation is always get a good pattern and get a good loaf and then start to tweak it in ways that you would really like to see the bread. Because you're, if you went straight to whole wheat flour, you'd probably almost have a miserable experience. But if you had a nice working standard bread flour loaf and you gradually increase the wheat flour, that would probably work pretty well. Um, I've had fun sprinkling on poppy seeds or sesame seeds or caraway seeds on the bread as a last step, you can moist, moisten the top and score it and then just sprinkle that on so it's all kind of on the top or you could even embed it in the dough toward the end. And so I've had friends do that with seeds or they'll put cheese in at the very end right before they bake it. Um, and then I showed you a couple of different shapes but you can also make rolls. I, you know, instead, instead of making two loaves I could easily make for instance eight uh, rolls. You just, you make it, you're cutting the dough up into smaller pieces and you shape it and you give it a little X for, for the uh, scoring and it makes for wonderful, uh, wonderful rolls at dinner or for parties or whatever. And then, like I was mentioning, the extra fermentation overnight using an abanaton, that will give it some extra character. It may not pop as much in terms of rising uh, during the baking, but it does uh, add, add sourness to the flavor. Some final tips and tricks. Um, again, I suggest you start with the basic stuff and you can get fancy later after you've got something working. Don't overwork the dough. You'll see that I didn't really work the dough too much, right? If there's any mistakes that people make, it's overproofing or overworking the dough. You know, let the dough do its thing. You, you, you let the dough uh, do all the hard work. Another nice subtle thing is Let's say you're out of time and you guys and someone says, oh, but we have dinner reservations and you're going, oh, but I'm in the middle of making bread. Just put the dough in the refrigerator. You know, the, this container, uh, you know, this proofing box, 
you know, let's say you're in the middle of something, you can just throw it in the in the refrigerator and come back to it. Yeah, it'll take a little longer, but maybe it'll be a little sour and you don't want it to ruin your evening. That's okay. So take advantage of the fact that the refrigerator will retard the process. It won't stop it completely, but it will do some retarding of the process. And again, like I was showing earlier on, you do always want to start with a happy bubbly starter. Otherwise, you'll wonder why, when is my bread going to rise uh, if you don't have a nice bubbly starter. Reminder that, again, as long as you remember the salt and you don't burn the bread, it's going to taste great. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, the, the Where you score bread. So I, I scored it a certain way. I showed you that. But you can experiment with how to score the bread in different patterns. It will actually change the shape of how the bread um, comes out. So give it a try. Just like you sometimes see with um, baguettes, you could try a diagonal scoring, for instance, and see what happens. There's all kinds of fun things you can do there. Um, keeping your starter fed is obviously important. We kind of already covered that. And then lastly, this is a good one to know is the bread's gonna last uh, a good three to four days um, without any trouble. And uh, what I typically do to store it is nothing special, but just put it on a cutting board, you know, open side down like so, boom. This, this is a fine way to store your bread. And, you know, after a few days, you might, you know, go, well, I'm going to need to toast it or whatever. That's fine. But it's going to keep pretty well. You can put it in a bread box, but you have to be careful of moisture in a bread box after a few days or it will mold. But finally, let's say that you made um, multiple loaves of bread and you knew you weren't going to eat it. You can just wrap it up in foil and freeze it. And when you are ready to eat it, just pull it out of the freezer. It's going to be ready to go in a couple hours and it's going to taste just about as good as you know the 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 warm stuff that just came out of the oven we've already checked on the bake again here it is i made a little bit of a mistake but it doesn't seem to have been fatal that's always good and that's the end of the presentation thank you so much gene so we have quite a few questions for you great uh, have you ever baked uh, sourdough in a bread loaf pan? The closest thing I've used is, uh, so I guess the short answer is I, I did initially, it was okay, um, but, I, uh, but I think it just, it always worked, you know, I, I quickly moved to the Dutch oven to get that extra steam. So it, it'll certainly work in a, in, a, in a bread loaf pan, try it out, uh, but you may find that you're going to want that extra steam for the extra pop. Great, thank you. And so when, you know, making your starter or picking it up, um, can it wait to be fed two weeks later? Because, you know, not going to get it in time because their mother is taking, um, picking it up. Yeah, so um, I highly recommend that you do try to feed it uh, or at least get it cold. You need, first of all, it'll be very freshly made before I come down. And so technically, as long as it's kept cold, it won't need to be fed for about two weeks. Um, I just recommend because, you know, you, the sooner you get it, you're going to want to go ahead and, and feed it if you can. Um, but it could go up to two weeks before you do that initial feeding. Just make sure it gets refrigerated as soon as possible. I'm going to bring them down cold and hopefully, and I know Vanessa is going to keep them cold in a refrigerator as well. So if you keep it cold, you can, it gives you, it buys you time. Great, thank you. We do have a participant who's interested if you named your starter. Never did. I've heard people do that. Never did. <laughs> it's funny, but I have heard people do that. Uh, let's see. Do you add any yeast to starter at the beginning? Uh, none whatsoever. That's kind of the fun about this bread is it's it's all kind of doing it all on its own. Now, some people say that when you make baguettes, uh, the, the classic baguette recipe actually is with uh, a little bit of instant uh, yeast, uh, but I've never bothered to do that. Uh, is there any way to fix it if you accidentally let the dough proof so long that it became all goopy and sticky and wouldn't rise? So um, there, uh, I've had that problem before, and um, I've with with some moderate success, you can you know get, basically give it a little bit more flour and water and uh, see if you can get it to, to hold together. But what I would almost recommend is just go ahead and bake it and enjoy it because it's still gonna taste good. 
it just will might be flat. But you know, it still tastes good. And you know, it sour, sourdough bread makes for great French toast. And you know, there's all kinds of things you can do with it. So, thank you. Um, how do you know once the starter has died? Okay, so the starter, you, I would only throw away the starter if it's basically started to turn colors. So if you left the starter, I think I did this as an experiment a while ago, where I just put it in a separate container and just kind of watched it for you know, way longer than it's supposed to be. And it started to get like a little bit of a pink color. And you, if you read the books, they, I think people talk about, you know, when you see some funky colors. Um, but other than that, even if it smells a little bit, because, um, you know, fresh, the fresh sourdough smells like really yummy, tasty, uh, doughy smell, which is great. But even if it's a couple of weeks old, it, it might smell a little bit like paint, but don't panic, right? Uh, just feed it and use it and it'll probably be fine. If you can feed it and you get that nice happy starter and you smell that and it smells fine, you're in good shape. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, we have a lot of questions. We are running out of time, so I'm just gonna choose one more question. And happy to answer others in, you know, in, a, in any kind of separate communication. Great, uh, what's your favorite non-bread recipe using sourdough starter? Uh, um, we do do sometimes sourdough pancakes. Um, it's interesting because I, I wish there were more, I suppose, recipes out there and I haven't invested the time uh, to do that. But so I'd say the, power, the sourdough pancakes. So you can make sourdough pancakes and they, and they, they will taste sour. Wow, thank you. Well, Jean, I want to thank you for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge and your insights with us and for this live demo. Thank you to our audience for your questions and for attending this event. We will follow up within the next week or so with the recorded video and any presentation materials. We will get you that recipe for the starter. Uh, we will have more Mud Talks in 2023, so stay tuned. If you are interested in being a Mud Talk speaker yourself, please contact us at alumni at hmc.edu. All future events can be found on our website, alumni.hmc.edu. Have a great night and holiday season, everyone. We'll see you in 2023. Thank you.